scientist. I, I do social science, and I'm I'm optimistic that when we show people data, they will get uh, convinced. But whoa, what about things like climate change? There's masses of data, and people uh, don't want to jump out of their box. They rather feel the fear and stay yeah. contracted. So, so the problem the problem with uh, the data on on climate change is, I think it's it's remote and distant and hard to accept. Not every not every data is as easy to explore as others. And particularly when we have experimental data, I believe particularly experimental data. When you have correlational data, people can always argue uh, against it. Yeah. Um, you know, people argued for a long time against uh, smoke and uh, all kinds of lung disease because it was just correlational. Um, so I, I try to do experiments. So I'll give you one a little example. Uh, we've been having questions about uh, bonuses for bankers. Mm-hmm. Right? Does it work? Right? I mean, <clears throat> people have tremendous theories about how important bonuses are and how they motivate people. And we said, let's just test it out. So we created a little experiment and we asked people to do six tasks that would take about an hour that require creativity and thoughtfulness and the concentration and so on. And we said to one group, we said, if you do all of these tasks well, I'll give you one day of salary. If you do half of them well, half their salary, a third, a third, zero, zero. A second group, we said, if you do those well, we'll give you two weeks of salary. That's the bonus. And the third group, we said, if you do this well, we'll give you five months salary. And we ran this experiment in India when we couldn't afford a five-month salary. <clears throat> what happened? Performance was the same for the one-day bonus and the two-week bonus. And performance went down dramatically for the five months bonus wow. condition. Was now, this because people were more anxious? Exactly. So it turns out that money is a motivator and a stressor. Now, if we do this experiment with simple mechanical tasks, jumping, tapping, doing stuff, more money, higher performance because you can control your muscles. Right? If I say jump, I'll be a dollar for jump. You'll jump a little. If I say give you a thousand, you'll spend much more time jumping. Right? You'll jump much quicker. But our mind is not exactly like that. You can't will yourself in the same way into higher level of performance. You can't close your eyes and all of a sudden be more creative or thoughtful or have a better memory or better ideas. And it, it actually turns out that in those cases, it's the stress about money that is actually occupying part of your brain and getting you less active. And actually, if you think about it, the intuition is there. Uh, imagine you were going into some delicate brain surgery. And I said, you have a choice. You can, before you go into surgery, you can have a little chat with your surgeon. And you can tell them that you'll give them a million dollars if they do well. And you'll sue them if they do very badly. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, you freak <laughs> out your poor surgeon. <laughs> That's right. Do you really want to do that? Right? And most people say, no, because they understand that under those conditions, the surgeon will focus on the, oh, my goodness, my yacht is going. Or, oh, my goodness, I'm going to be sued. <laughs> and what you really want, people, is not to think about the money. So climate change, I think, is a great example. So... Here is, yeah, this is the only thing in the world that uh, Joseph Stalin and Mother Teresa agreed on. And, and Mother Teresa said, if I look at the masses, I will never act. If I look at the one, I will. And Stalin said, one death is a tragedy, a million is a statistic. And we have this idea called the identifiable victim effect. That when we see one little kid, uh, hungry, starving, and we can help them, our heart goes to them and we, and we act. When we see a million, we just don't care as much. And there's lots of demonstrations uh, about this, of course. And actually, if you think about climate change, uh, climate change, actually, i say the other way around. If you went and said, I want to create a problem that people would not care about, you would create climate change, a uh, climate uh, increase. Why? Because long in the future, will happen to other people first. We don't see it progressing. We don't see anybody particular suffering. And anything we would do as individuals is a drop in the bucket. All of those are the known forces that basically create empathy, and they all come together in global warming. But there is another anxiety, apart from all those ones you've mentioned. It's like the famous one that um, Upton Sinclair, I think, said, you know, uh, people will do a lot not to see what their salary depends on them not seeing. That's right. So, therefore, um, you know, even if somebody sees that it's now and it's huge and it's terrible and it's... Real people. I, think, I think that people have a tremendous capacity for compassion. And I think if you got people to see other individual examples, not the problem as a whole, but if you got them to see particular individuals who are suffering, there will be some action. The problem with global warming is it requires a continuous action. Right? People, people are uh, capable of thinking about the problem and say, I want to do something and opening the wallet and being incredibly 
generous. What is hard to do is to do something all the time. You know, this is why dieting is so difficult. You know, there are some decisions you have to do once, and that's it. Like, even, even savings, right? You can decide to increase your automatic deduction from your paycheck every month and put the money into long-term savings, and that does it for you. You only have to decide once, and the action is carried out for you. Um, global warming, there are some things you can do occasionally, like you can change your car, you can change your refrigerator and so on, but a lot of the activity really depends on continuous so action. D- and, and, and because we have so many opportunities to fail, we would, we would fail on many of them. So, so one of the things we, we, we find in general is that people think that they make decisions, but we're largely uh, creatures of our environment, that actually the environment determines to a large degree what, what we would do. Uh, you know, the, the, the nicest examples are from food. There's a, a Brian Wansick who does this beautiful research, has a beautiful e- example. He gives people soup. And what they don't know is that the soup dish is connected to the table and it has a hose connected to a big bowl of soup and he can inject soup back into your bowl. And people start eating and he injects soup into it slower than the speed that they eat. People eat much more soup. Why? Because we don't really know how much we've had we look at the soup bowl, we say, okay, I'm going to finish it, and we finish whatever. So, so habits are a big part of how we make decisions, right? You don't want to make decisions all the time, and habits are a really good, easy thing. Oh, I'll just do what I did before. So from that perspective, habit take over, and then even when things change, we keep on doing it the way we've done it before. So I agree, absolutely agree with that. Um, kind of a tuning principle, I, I don't think that has changed. But I agree with you that as the world becomes more complex, we create more and more habits for us to deal with the complexity. And therefore, we actually actively make less and less decisions just because the world is more, more complex.